In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. The first Sunday of the month of Una, the church introduces for us what we like to call the school of Christ. The lessons that our Lord gave to his disciples about prayer. And those lessons is not only for the disciples, but for the whole church, because the disciples represent the church. So the church give us this wonderful passage from the Gospel according to St. Luke. And uh, if you notice, St. Luke always in his Gospel shows us our Lord Jesus Christ praying in every work that he did and in every time. He showed us the praying Jesus. We saw him praying in the Jordan at the time of baptism, as the Gospel of St. Luke said, and while he prayed, the heaven was opened. So he was praying. We saw him also praying before choosing his disciples. It says, now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself and from them he chose 12 whom he also named apostles. He was praying. In various situations, St. Luke always showed us that Jesus was praying. And we have to know that Christ was really praying. Not only to teach us how to pray, but also because truly he is interceding on behalf of humanity and asking for them before his Father. When, uh, when the disciples noticed that Christ is always praying, and because they also noticed the peace, the joy, the love and the fellowship between him and the Father in every time he prayed, one of his disciples came and said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Perhaps sometimes the beginning in the life of prayer is an imitation. I imitate someone whom I saw praying. They saw Christ praying. He was praying a lot. Or another kind of imitation that was mentioned in the Gospel of today as it is written, as John also taught his disciples. So they want to imitate the disciples of John the Baptist. They felt that praying is a good thing to learn. They felt it's good to practice and to enjoy. The prayer life, my beloved, might start as an imitation or might start as a learning process but definitely it will turn to be joyful and sweet afterwards the strange thing if you noticed in the Old Testament 
you couldn't or you will not find a single commandment saying you shall pray. For example, the first five books of Moses in the Old Testament, which dictates to the people of Israel how to worship God, said or mentioned a lot of things like worship the Lord your God. It mentioned remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It mentioned you shall not murder. It mentioned you shall not steal. But amazingly, we can't find a commandment saying you shall pray. But the more strange thing that we find is that despite the fact that there is no commandments about praying, we found all, all those who lived with God and for God in the Old Testament lived a life of prayer. All of them lived a life of prayer. That's why we saw Abraham, the father of the fathers. His life was full of praying. His life was full of conversations with God to the extent that they called him the friend of God, Khalil Allah, the friend of God. He talks so much with God as friends talk to each other. Moses, the head of the prophets, his life was about talking, sorry, taking commandments from the Lord and from the mouth of the Lord and deliver it to the people. To the extent also that they called Moses the speaker with God. He always speaks with God. As if they are two men speaking to each other face to face. Or as they say, mouth to ear. Elijah, Daniel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and so many more in the Old Testament. Everyone who lived with God, he lived a life of prayer. Prayer was an essential element in his life or her life. To the extent that David the psalmist, from the much love of prayer he said, but I give myself to prayer, or as the New International Virgin translation, but I am a man of prayer, but I love it more in the Arabic, but I am a prayer, I am a prayer, أما أنا فصلاة. So prayer simply is an association, a fellowship, a companionship, and also is a need. It is a need man feels. That's why he practices it naturally. He wants to talk to God. Man wants to interact with God, with his creator. And to establish a strong relation with God. So we see that the life of prayer could start as a kind of imitation to other people. But on the way, man will discover that prayer is a need and a necessity to have a strong bond with his God, whom he follows, whom he worships and hopes. In the school of Christ, teaching the disciples how to pray, he gave them the first lesson when he answered them saying, 
when you pray and notice the word when you pray we discover from those three words of our Lord that the first lesson was and is still that praying is not a compulsive action it is not a forcing act Praying is not something that man does to please God or to pay the dues to God because the fact is God does not need either man's worship nor his obligations. But when you pray here as a kind of free will if you want to pray, if you feel the need to pray. So the first lesson is that praying ought to be the outcome of free will. The outcome of feeling that you need to pray and not a result of pressure, obligation or an order. The second lesson that we shall receive today with the disciples is a general view of the Lord's Prayer, its content and its center theme. The greatness of this prayer is that the Lord himself uttered its words and because it is coming out of the mouth of our Lord himself. So it is the model of the prayers that pleases God's heart. The model of the accepted prayer because it phrases or expresses God's thinking, God's will and God's intentions toward men. It really articulates what God wants man to ask from him and he will give him always. That's why the Lord's Prayer is a guaranteed prayer or guaranteed to enter the depth of God's heart if man prays it with awareness, with understanding, and with feeling of need. This is a general view of the Lord's Prayer, but what about its content? Actually, the Lord's Prayer consists of seven supplications or seven requests or seven entreats, entreaties. Man asks before God. And as you know, the number seven is very famous by its meaning, perfection, perfection. So that means that the Lord's Prayer has all or has the perfection of beseechings of man through what he wants to achieve in his relationship with God. Those seven petitions are divided into two categories. The first three are pertain to God Himself, concerning God Himself. And they are, hallowed be thy name, or your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. Those are the first three supplications that we offer in front of God and it concerns God concerns his name concern his kingdom and concern his will the next four are distinguished that they are for man's need and they are give us our daily bread forgive us our sins do not lead us into temptation and the fourth is deliver us from the evil one.
So now we have just an idea about the content. The last point that I want to mention is about the center theme or idea of the Lord's Prayer. In fact, all the Lord's Prayer is centered around one phrase. That is, your kingdom come. This is the center theme. This is the center topic of the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come. Man asks for the kingdom of God and looks forward to it. And this kingdom comes through the hallowing of the name of God in man's life and through fulfilling God's will. Whenever man longs for this kingdom, he also longs for the food of this kingdom to live by it. For this kingdom to come, man has to seek reconciliation both with God and with people. Reconciliation with God comes by the forgiveness of sins. And reconciliation with people comes by forgiving those who is indebted to us. Lastly, to keep enjoying this kingdom, we request protection. We request protection from the enemy and from temptations. I pray that God may grant us the acceptance of each prayer that is uttered from our mouth. To him is due all glory now and ever unto the ages of all ages. Amen. <laughs> Oh, no,